Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, I am Jim Wells, the manager of Dead Horse Point. Um, I've been with the Utah State Parks for quite a while. I've worked at uh, Great Salt Lake State Park, Goblin Valley, now Dead Horse Point. I've also worked at national parks throughout the country from Vermont to California. Um, so I've been in parks in general for about 12 years now. Um, so yeah, but today we are talking about Dead Horse Point uh, State Park, which I think, is everyone familiar with Dead Horse Point? Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, awesome. Uh, so the basics, these are things you're mostly familiar with then. The main purpose of the park is the 2,000 foot drop into the canyon to the Colorado River from the point. It's an amazing view, one of my favorite views in the entire world. Uh, some people say it's even better than the Grand Canyon. That's up to you if you agree <laughs> or not. But other than the view, if you want to do other things while you're there, we do have nine miles of hiking trails, 16 miles of biking trails. That's about to be expanded, as I'll get to later. Uh, 56 campsites, and what partial hookup means, it means um, water, or sorry, it means electricity, but no water. Um, we have nine yurts, so little tent cabins, uh, food concessions, and the visitor center and gift shop. I have a picture of that because we're not going to come back to it later. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew it did exist. We do have rangers on duty every day to answer your questions in the visitor center. Uh, we are one of 46 uh, Utah State Parks, right, located right outside of Moab, right there. And the park is actually quite large. Um, it extends upwards this way, as well as out to Miner's Point and beyond uh, to the east there. And that is areas that we'll be expanding into shortly. But as you can see, all the hiking trails tend to be in the south, biking trails in the north, and there's a lot, days, to explore if you actually have time uh, to do so. But since you're already familiar, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are on online are as well, with Dead Horse Point, uh, just showing you pictures of the view for an hour would be no fun. So uh, here's our topics we'll cover. Um, the geology of Dead Horse Point, how it relates to the Colorado Plateau, uh, the legend. There's a lot of things people say about how Dead Horse Point got its name. Well, I did some research, and I figured out what I believe is actually uh, how it got its name, which is a, just slightly different than what people commonly believe. There's, people are close, but not quite. Um, going into, if you haven't been there in a while, what's new? We've done a lot in the last 15 years, and what is coming, um, including some trails out to the Historic Hall line. There's going to be a, a movie tour, all kinds of stuff like that. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. So first, the Colorado Plateau. Uh, everyone in this room is familiar with it. Uh, it is located in the Four Corners area of the United States, the American West. Why I use this picture instead of something in Utah, it's actually in Arizona, the Mogollon Rim, is that in all my experience traveling around the Colorado Plateau and entering it, this is the one location where you actually see it rise in front of you over 1,000 feet. It's an amazing location. If you ever have a chance to go down there outside of Pace and south of Flagstaff, it is worthwhile. And once you're on top, you go from a low, uh, very, very dry desert environment to typically a higher desert environment. Even though it may seem arid to you, we do get a lot more rainfall than the, uh, to the west and the south of us. It is, we are bounded, the Rocky Mountains to the east, Basin Range uh, to the west, just so you have some context as the other physiographic regions of, of the United States in general, uh, as well as the American West. And it's all formed about the same time period as the Rocky Mountains, as Basin Range, and what forms it is the ancient Farallon Plate being subducted, it's an oceanic plate, uh, but different than Pacific Plate, uh, being subducted under North America, melting, and causing rise. Uh, historically, geologic historically, uh, the American West has generally been quite flat, whether it was large sand dunes, ocean, whatever, marshland, it's only fairly recently um, that the Rocky Mountains and everything else rose up within the last few tens of millions of years. Even though it started 80 million years ago, you didn't really get the mountains in their current form until 30 to 40 uh, million years ago. Uh, this is not the best slide I could have chosen, but it is the slide that's in the public domain. Others actually showed the little Colorado Plateau we were right there, which was kind of cool. I just couldn't use it. Um, but yes, yeah, same exact process. And then west of that basin range where the landscape is being um, expanded and some mountain ranges where it folds. Now when things rise, water cuts them back down. Um, you see that all around us here in canyon country. In fact, as the Colorado Plateau goes, there are several provinces within it. We are, which should not surprise you, within the Canyonlands uh, province of the Colorado Plateau. That's true uh, where Dead Horse Point is. That's true where Torrey is. Um, the two main rivers are the, uh, the green and the Colorado, of course, the Colorado being under Dead Horse Point. Uh, but all of the, its tributaries create deep cuts as well. Um, some of the most dramatic landscape probably on Earth, to be completely honest. Yeah. 
And that, at Dead Horse Point, gives you a view of hundreds of millions of years of geologic history. Uh, just standing up here, this is on uh, the Twisted Tree Bike Trail. You're also allowed to hike them if you ever wanted to. Um, on the Cayenta layer, looking down at Wingate, those are the dramatic cliffs below Dead Horse Point, uh, 400 feet as much as 600 feet in some locations, just a straight drop down. Then it kind of starts sloping off into the Chinle layer, the Moenkopi layer. When you get down to the river, not visible in this shot, you have the Cutler layer, which is almost 300 million years old. And what that allows us to do is find out what environments looked like back in that day. We'll start with the easy one. The easy one is Chinle, the petrified wood. Because you find petrified wood, you know that it was a forest. Um, this is not around Dead Horse Point, although I've seen petrified wood uh, in, say, the Centerfell Swell. It is there. And what's cool is that um, when you look at, and this is not me inside a mine, it's me looking into a mine. If you shine a black light, the petrified wood will glow because there's uranium inside of it. So if you ever want to do that, just find a mine that you can peer into with a black light and go at night, and it's absolutely amazing. I didn't believe it until I tried it myself, and sure enough, <laughs> yeah. And just for fun, have a Geiger counter too, because it will, yeah, it'll go off. <laughs> What's that? Is it dangerous? If you go inside the mine, it is dangerous. So that's why I don't advise you go inside. Now, just being at the entrance with a reading of three for a short time period, uh, no, you just don't, don't spend the night. <laughs> it has a, a dosimeter thing here too, so you can see how much radiation you're absorbing. It's almost zero, as long as you just walk by, yeah. Um, Sometimes it's not so obvious. You kind of have to know what different um, rock layers mean. Let's look at Wingate and Cayenta and what we know about those. So Wingate, sheer cliffs. So what does that mean? It means that the sediment was not very well held together, so it's easy to erode uh, when it gets exposed to water. And so that would be, if it's sandstone and it's not well held together, sand dunes, uh, that kind of landscape. Once it gets compacted, you know it's starting to get wetter. And so we can draw uh, some timelines. Uh, and this is the UGS, Utah Geological uh, Society, um, Utah Geological Service, sorry. Um, giant sand dune fields when Wingate was formed. Over time, now this is post Kyantic. I they didn't have a map of the Kyanta time period, but it's getting wetter and wetter and wetter is, is my point. Uh, during Kyanta, these big lakes weren't there, but it was still uh, stream beds and marshland. And what that does, it creates more compact sediment that does not erode quite as easily. That's why it does not look like the Wingate sandstone. And you might be looking at these years and thinking, are there dinosaur tracks? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, there aren't many in Dead Horse Point. Those that do exist, you can barely notice unless you have someone with you who's trained in it. Um, this was actually, these were both discovered by actually an archaeologist who wanted to be a paleontologist, funny enough. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, they're right along popular trails, and people generally don't even know uh, that they're there, but they are. And, this, and throughout the Moab area, you will find dinosaur tracks everywhere. Um, some of them are obvious, some of them are labeled. Others are not. You just have to know where to look. But yeah, they do exist. And these in particular, I did ask um, our geologists, Dilophos, I don't, it's, it's the Jurassic Park uh, spitting dinosaur, but in reality, they're a lot bigger, um, is what that is. If you want to know more, um, the Utah Geologic History, uh, the UGS, as I mentioned, uh, does have some free resources. These do cover different uh, time frames, or not different time frames, but they do give different cross sections, which website you go to. And then you have the best that I've ever even heard of is Ron Blakely's Deep Time, where he has the entire world, as it looked like, in 10 million year intervals, uh, going back to, I think, 700 million years ago. Um, you can't show those online. He does have you pay for it because he's dedicated his life's work to it. But it's something if you want to look into on your own time, I do highly uh, encourage it because they're amazing when you look at them. Now, as we go on, that brings us to the present day where the American West, as we all know, is dry and hot, not very hospitable. And that kind of starts leading into the Dead Horse Point legend. Horses die throughout the American West. <laughs> These are all the place names in the country that is a dead horse. Um, <laughs> the red ones are the points. There's actually two dead horse points in Utah. The other one is, is over in Beaver County. It's been forgotten for almost a century now. Uh, but it is still a private mining claim, so you can't go there. I would go there otherwise. Um, those of you who are local know that there is a dead horse point, or sorry, dead horse lake in Boulder Mountain just south of here. You've got to hike to it, but it is there. Um, 
and then many, many others. You can do this with any uh, place name that you can think of. When I put this online, it was like, look at the research I did. One of my friends said, wow, I grew up in Oklahoma where there was a dead woman wash and a dead woman mound right next to my house. Like, ooh. And she said, yeah, that's a pioneer history, which a lot of this, of course, relates to um, as well. So yeah, uh, not very hospitable. If you wanted to be a horse, I guess, in American history, being the Great Plains or the Deep South, you'd be a lot safer. <laughs> Um, some of these have legends that are easy to find. For example, Dead Horse Ranch in Arizona, which people often mix up with Dead Horse Point. We'll get campers coming in with reservations to Dead Horse Ranch. We're like, I'm sorry, that's about 10 hours away. <laughs> but it's nice when you have a primary source when the park was purchased who said, yeah, we were going, looking to buy a property and my kids liked the property with a dead horse on it, strangely enough. Uh, but that's a primary source. They know exactly where their legend came from. We don't. Um, whatever made Dead Horse Point has been lost largely to history. I've heard a lot of things. Horses were rounded up, is most of the legends, but why was it done? Was it bandits and horse thieves? Well, possibly because, look, horse thieves were huge around uh, this part of the American West. Butch Cassidy and uh, the Wild Bunch, very famous, but they were not the only ones. In fact, it's so, such a common name, the BLM has a horse thief campground right next to Dead Horse Point, so it would make sense. Um, so, but were all horses then killed, corralled up and left to die because they were competing with cattle? Was it only unfit horses that were left to die? Was it conflict with the Native Americans? Because in Moab, the settlers in the Ute tribe did have a lot of conflict at the turn of the century, a little bit before the turn of the century, the 20th century, that is. Um, or did people come up and there were just some dead horses and they named it after that? The only thing that has nothing to do with physically, like, previously alive dead horses is this. Um, if you look off the main overlook, there is a rock formation that looks like a horse uh, laying down. Um, and with binoculars from above, it looks perfectly like one. So maybe it was that. So what I did in preparation for this talk is I went through 105 years of newspaper articles relating to the name Dead Horse Point. And here's what I found. <laughs> Um, they all relate to Dead Horse Point beyond the neck. So the park is bigger, right? But the Dead Horse Point itself, if you look at an aerial photo, is this. It's where the landscape becomes very narrow and it comes back out. So the horses were said to be corralled beyond this. Makes sense, there's no water out there. Um, when you look at it in person, this is on the Eastern Trail, you can see how it narrows up right there to basically just the width of a road plus uh, two trails on either side. When you get out there, there is a fence, but I am 99.999% sure this is a recreation for a couple of reasons. First of all, I have seen even just tree limb fences from the turn of the 20th century. None of them are as in good shape as this. We don't normally maintain that either. Also, look at the size of it. I can step over this. It's not going to stop a horse that's desperate to get out. Uh, so even though we don't have records of when this was built, it's probably some park manager back in the 60s or 70s putting it in because it would look cool, like a corral. Um, can't prove it, but that's almost certainly what it was. Now, how old is the name? Well, this is interesting. The first newspaper reference of Dead Horse Point is from the Moab Times in 1937, but that article says the famous Dead Horse Point, implying that it was known long uh, before then. There were previous articles mentioning Dead Horse Point, but that was the other Beaver County one, and they were all excited about all the, the silver and gold being found in that mine, completely overshadowing anything going on in the Moab area. Um, in 1938, we get our first mention of how old the name might be. Um, an old cow poke a generation ago. The generation ago is the important thing. Um, the generations back in that part of the 20th century, I actually researched that too, were not the 15-year generations we kind of use today, they were 20 years. So we're looking at, if that is correct, the 19-teens, um, just after World War I, uh, perhaps. Um, and then the rest of it's kind of neat. And who would think that one day the horseless carriage would drive to its rim and show people its wonders? Um, after that, it starts getting mentioned all the time. People from the East Coast are coming out on tours. And the reason for that is that Arches National Monument, which had been a monument for over 10 years at this point, but finally got a good road going in, got some campgrounds and visitor services. It was a tourist attraction, so some remote thing that the president set aside. Now people are coming to see Arches. They want to see what else is in the area. That includes Dead Horse Point. So becoming very famous very quickly. 
This is the favorite, my favorite article that I came across. Um, from 1951, it just shows many years ago by old timers. So by 1951, it's now older history than the name was. But it's just fun because this is an, uh, someone in Thompson Springs, Utah, who's complaining about the youngins and the tourists who are trying to change the name because they don't like the Dead Horse Point. <laughs> it's, it's an article that you could read today and it would uh, say about the same thing. Uh, so I just like how people are people no matter when you are. Um, <laughs> And I've never heard of anyone trying to change Death Valley's name. And yeah, I used to live in Death Valley. I would prefer they not change that name either. <laughs> um, so now with that established, what are people saying back then as to what the name means? They do say there were horses dead out there. And why they were dead is that the cowboys went out. They corralled the wild desert ponies. They picked the good ones out, but they did not corral them in. They just left them. Uh, that's uh, this article from 1949 in the Tribune and Park City Record 1955. They're telling the same story. Um, and this kind of makes sense because, yeah, you would corral them in a spot you could control them, but why would you build a fence? Like, you, that, that seems like something extra that you wouldn't actually have to do. Once you got the horses you want, you would leave, and you would assume that the others would find their own way out. Well, they didn't. Um, and that kind of makes sense, too, because back in the day, there was no road or obvious path. It would have been a bunch of rocks um, at that neck area, and a horse might not necessarily think to look there to find their way out, and over time, they would uh, die of thirst. So um, it does appear that it was unfit horses who died, at least according to the cowboys, and it was just a couple unfortunate animals instead of a purposeful culling. It was just... Eh, they didn't find out their way out as we thought. So that is what I've discovered as what the name probably is from, although nothing completely definitive. Um, it does mean that we'll probably be changing our brochure because it's a game of telephone over time. Uh, it's also known as ranger lore in our field where rangers tell stories over, over many decades and they get distorted. Um, so we'll, in our new brochure, which we're going to make uh, this coming year, we'll probably take out the corral reference. Um, so is that better? Is it worse than what the legend had been saying? It's up to you. Uh, the horses still died, but um, it wasn't intentional. Now, since we're going into history, I could probably tell you the history of the park. It's just real quick. Uh, it was established in 1959. Um, just like other parks in the area, like Goblin Valley, people were creating to the landscape. Now that tourism had picked up, it needed to be protected. It was um, thought it to get, become a national park. The Park Service didn't want it, at least not yet. Um, so it became a state park instead, one of the very first of the Utah State Parks. It was only two years after the agency was founded. Um, and it was actually originally encompassed or, or proposed to, be, to encompass everything we now know as Island in the Sky District of Canyonlands. Um, the state ended up not, not wanting all that land, so the National Park Service got it. And then the state tried to turn the state park over to the National Park Service for continuity, and that was rejected um, until finally, in 1966, uh, the first full visitor services. By 1966, you had the visitor center, the, the Kamloop Campground, which we all now call Kayenta Campground. I don't know why that name was changed. And 50,000 visitors were recorded. After that, not much happened. I've, I really looked until 1999, when the visitor center was expanded, and they recorded 200,000 annual visitors. And then things really, really, really started taking off. And as visitation, uh, increased to today's 1.14 million, things in the park started to develop. Uh, for example, if you haven't been there in the last decade, we now have the Wingate Campground, which has expanded our park from 21 to 57 uh, campsites. We now have nine yurts, um, which are Mongolian-style tent, quote, cabins. Um, if you want to see the inside of one, they look like this. Uh, so it's pretty nice. Just got to bring your own bedding, but everything else is there for you, including a grill. In um, 2016, we achieved international dark sky status. Uh, so Tori is an international dark sky community. We're an international dark sky park. I believe in terms of the entire world, like political jurisdictions, Utah has more dark sky places than anyone else. Uh, so it's actually very impressive. Uh, Goblin Valley was one as well when I was uh, there as manager. Now, with designation comes a lot of diverse interpretive programs. So if you ever want to go there at night, there's usually something going on every week. It's not every day, but it's every week, whether it be depending on um, the moon cycle. Could it be a uh, star party? Could be a full moon hike? Uh, could be a sunset talk? You watch the sun go down is just amazing on its own at Dead Horse Point. And then we have scorpion hunts. 
Um, I really appreciate Koi is our naturalist. She's great at finding scorpions. I am not. I tried to do this a few times at Goblin Valley. I never found one. It was really embarrassing to go out there with people. So it's good to have someone who is skilled uh, in that. <laughs> but they do. Under a black light, just like that petrified wood I showed earlier, they do glow um, under, under black light. They actually glow under the full moon as well, but it takes a little bit more to find them. We did expand our bike trail network to that 16 miles that I uh, mentioned earlier. It's now 17 if you count the new Mount Miners Point Trail, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, and it will be expanded even more soon. This is Big Chief Overlook looking out uh, to the east, one of several overlooks on that trail system. And we do have plans coming up. First, uh, this is exciting. This only came about last month. Um, we're going to have a regional auto tour for movies through the Utah Office of Tourism. Um, the main focus is going to be Thelma and Louise. Um, that's probably what Dead Horse Point is most known for. Now, it's important to note that they did not, the car didn't go off Dead Horse Point. That would have been a thousand foot drop. No, uh, instead, behind Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible there, uh, you can see the actual point that Thelma and Louise went out. It's previously called Fossil Point, still is geologically, but uh, people know it's Thelma and Louise Point. And then from there down to the river, they had several takes where they threw the car off, brought it back up. Uh, the whole town went out to watch the event. It was kind of fun. <laughs> Um, and of course, Westworld, uh, beyond that, The Mandalorian has been filmed uh, near Dead Horse Point, actually right off the rim of Dead Horse Point, and uh, many others as well. And the auto tour is planned to take you around the greater Moab area, and I think elsewhere in Utah that the office of tourism is working on, to just, kind of like New Zealand is doing with some of their movies, show you where everything was filmed, uh, for those who are into that. And coming in 2025, it's going to be the Far East Rim, or Potash. Um, expansion. So as I mentioned earlier, our trail system currently is this. It cuts out about a fourth of the park, which is undeveloped. There's the northern expansion, which we're still figuring out what to do with. And there's all of this. Um, when I walked out there, finally, as being manager, I was like, I know some of the stuff that's out there. I'm going to find the rest. And I'm going to make a new trail system. Um, so that is what we're working on. When you look at it from the visitor center, it is this rim over here, pretty far away. It, once you're out there, it really shows how massive Dead Horse Point actually is. When you're on the new trails and you look, it's not just the first ridge, not the second ridge, the third ridge over is where the Wingate Yurts are, um, and then it goes two more ridges beyond that. So Dead Horse Point is big, <laughs> bigger than most people think. This is the map, the trail map that will be. Uh, the names are not finalized um, for the most part about seven miles in total. It'll have biking access uh, from Big Chief coming down here, hiking access from the bike trail lot just to keep the bikers and hikers separated in the more popular areas. And then, um, yeah, if you wanna go south, if you wanna go east, a lot of options for you. And tons of different overlooks. Hi ho, hi ho, what does that mean after the seven dwarves? Seven dwarves, if you're the hiker going from the bike trail lot, this trail is gonna be a little bit of a slog. <laughs> so that's what we voted on with the staff on how to call it. <laughs> it's worth it, though. Um, here's just a couple of the overlooks that you'll see. Potash Point gets you as close as you possibly can to the Potash Pond. Some people like them, some people don't. I actually do like their colors on the landscape, but it's up to you. Um, nonetheless, you'll be right above them. Uh, the Potash Mining um, operation from Intrepid Potash. The Midpoint Overlook would be another one. And then what I want to talk about next is this. Um, this is the Mason Number no. 1 historic cable line, which we are applying to put on the National Register of Historic Places because of how actually impressive that thing was when it was built back in about 1949. And so we'll, we'll jump right back into some Colorado Plateau geology and history real quick, and then I'll show you what it looks like today in various places that you'll actually get to go see. Um, should be no surprise, if you look around the Colorado Plateau, you see a lot of mining operations of different kinds. And Moab, the big one, is potash. Uh, that's the potassium chloride uh, that they're injecting water uh, thousands of feet underground to the, to the um, paradox layer and getting it back up. That is also true, um, that same layer, not the method, of oil and natural gas. Um, Paradox layer is the remnant of an ancient ocean 
very shallow ocean where Moab was, but nonetheless, ancient ocean about 300 million years ago in that area. Um, and you can still see people pumping out the natural gas, especially in the area today. But historically, that's not how it was done. It was much lower. With, with technology that wasn't advanced, um, the oil industry was based all along the Colorado River, wherever they could fit something along its banks. Best picture I could find was from the Price Sun. I wish there was a better picture because it's actually really intriguing. Some of the, the ghost towns that, well, they were lively back then, uh, but later abandoned. The abandoned towns along the river's edge. And then the barge that would come out from the city of Moab every single day. Not just supplies, but tourism expeditions from the East Coast would use that barge to go down the river. Pretty cool. Um, but the barge was not enough, uh, and there was no railroad track back then, to really support these oil industries that were popping up. So they needed another idea, and it was twofold. First of all, obviously a road to the rim where the, ma the, um, the major pickup operations were to then bring the oil to market, they were located up there, but a road's gonna be really hard to dig through that cliffs. So while they were doing that, they had to make a gigantic 2,000 foot haul line system and oil line system going right up the sheer cliffs. Um, before I show you that, though, Long Canyon is worth driving today. Uh, that is the road that they, they dug out as they were um, making that cable line. Uh, this is the famous arch that's not arch, but fallen rock that creates an arch along that road. It comes, it's a, the four wheel driveway in a dead horse point. But here's the line that they built. It comes right off that 400 foot cliff uh, down to here. And then after that, it would, this is about that area, and then it would be brought down all the way to the oil operations. So, that's pretty unique nationwide, which is why the State Historical Preservation Office, SHPO, thought we could apply to be a natural, uh, sorry, national landmark. Um, it does not look like this now because that line in 2010, the Division of, of um, Wildlife Services said, that's kind of a danger where helicopters looking for the bighorn sheep, so we cut it in 2010. The line is still there. It just does not like uh, hang like that. It, it drops straight off the cliff now. There's a lot of artifacts along that route. Um, this is below the cliffs. Um, there's the old cable that got cut that's now laying down, the old oil line that goes down. Um, this is when we hiked up there. And the artifacts down there are better preserved than anything I think I've ever seen. You got this oil can from the 1940s, but you can still read the label on it. That's cool. Um, but of course the trails won't go there because how would you get people there? The trails instead are gonna explore the upper end of the operation. For example, Tank Point uh, is open now. We call it Miner's Point. Um, we can see the foundation of the giant oil tanks that used to collect what was coming up the pipeline to be then shipped off by truck. You'll be able to hike down the old road that the miners took every day to get out to the very end to get supplies up or down that cable system. The cable line's there the entire time. And then you'll we'll see as it comes up and drops off towards a new mining operation. But what's really neat at that point, the miner, uh, yeah, the miners actually carved their names into the, uh, the structure. They were so proud of it. These are families that still exist in Moab today. For example, uh, the Petiti family um, is very much still in Moab. Um, I've, I've talked to some of them, and they're going to come up and see, uh, see their grandfather's uh, signature. So that's kind of cool. And that sums up the stork line. This is another overlook before I ask for any questions. This is Dark Horse, where it's the far southern end of that new trail system. Actually, my favorite overlook, uh, looking dead south uh, towards um, the Abajo Mountains down there, and another view of the Colorado River uh, there. So when will that get done? We intend to work on it quite a lot this winter, so I'm hoping by spring 2025 we'll have the signs in, the trails marked, um, ready to explore. So yeah, ask me anything you want to know about Dead Horse Point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> Come on, baby. I can do this. Project. Can you ride e-bikes on the bike trails? Yes, you can. And that's a good question because it, it affects not just Dead Horse Point, but all Utah State Parks. Anywhere in a Utah State Park that you see a bike trail, E-bikes are allowed. So yes, that's Goblin Valley, Wasatch Mountain, Dead Horse Point, anything, anything like that. Yeah. Hey, what can you tell us about the uh, potash, uh, if I'm saying that right? Potash, yep. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, development, what goes on there? Yeah, so that's uh, the potash mine. Potash is used uh, primarily for fertilizer. It is a type of salt, but it's not table salt. It's more of an agricultural salt. And so it is a, one of the largest employers in Moab, uh, the Intrepid Potash Mining Company. And as I mentioned briefly before, uh, they use an injection mining system where they pump water down into the salt, the Paradox salt layer, which then dissolves it a bit. It comes back up. They put it in these ponds. And let's see if, yeah, this is, they put blue dye in. And depending on when you go, the blue dye might be fresh. It might be uh, starting to turn a whiter color. Um, and what that does, it allows the water to evaporate faster. It just makes the operation more efficient. Um, it's non-toxic, and they do have holding ponds so it doesn't get into the river. And uh, that salt layer you mentioned has something to do with the formation of the arches in Arches National Park. Did I read one time? Uh, I've not heard the arches. It does affect uh, the national parks, though. And I had a slide about that, but I thought it was going too off topic, so I took it out, unfortunately. Uh, but where you see it a lot is in uh, the Needles District of Canyonlands. We have those wide, like, flat valleys with the, with the towering, like, cliffs on the long side. And what causes that is that the Paradox layer um, kind of faults over time. The salt creates pockets and it caves in on itself. And it creates that dramatic landscape because, of course, if that caves in, everything above it goes down as well. Huh. Yeah. And, uh are some of the layers that you uh, pointed out, the geological layers you pointed out in your slide, also visible right here in Torrey? Um, are we the same elevation -ish, or You're not. not so uh, 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 Moab is 4,000 feet, Dead Horse is six, and I think Torrey is seven, actually, if I'm, seven yeah, 7,000, seven and up. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 Um, in the Moab area, yes. The park uh, is lower. The park is lower, yeah, yeah I was going to say. We do have yeah. those layers. We have yeah. to yeah. kind of yeah. the Wingate, the Chinley. Mm. Yeah. Some of those we had. Yeah. See a lot of Navajo sandstone in Capitol Reef, which of course we have in uh, the Moab area, just not in Dead Horse Point itself. Just north of Dead Horse Point you do. Yeah. So with the mining that's go been going on there in the past and, and that's coming there now, um, is there uh, lithium mining coming in? To um, what impact is I there? believe, I, I haven't followed the news on that that much. I think it's still undecided if I'm do, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're still going through the permit process on that. Yeah. You talked about how it, the visitation exploded at one point, yep. 1999 maybe? Um, uh, yeah, from 19, up until 1999, it had only gone up 150,000 over 30 years, and all of a sudden, from then on, it's almost, it's not quite exponential because that means something literal that is not, um, but it has gone like this, yeah. So is there um, conjecture about why that is, how that happened? Um, the Muddy Five campaign had an awful lot to do with it. Um, the Muddy Five campaign did not just bring tourists to the national parks. That wasn't actually the full goal. It was to bring them to the communities around the parks and the other attractions, one of which was the state parks. Uh, so, and then there was a Beyond the Mighty campaign, which then um, said, go beyond the parks and see these things. Mm -hmm. And that had a huge success. You brought in people from all over the world. And that was probably the cause up until 2019, then the pandemic, and then the post-pandemic surge, where everyone wanted to get out of their houses and explore the parks, um, especially since international travel hadn't picked up yet. Um, we saw an explosion then as well. Now, it has slowed. Um, our visitation continues to go up, but at a much slower pace than before. Um, so I'm also curious if you have any kind of statistics about, I think it was 1.4 million visitors a year. 1.14. 1.14. Okay. Um, do you have any idea how many people really stay and explore the park? I had no idea the park was that big. It's hard to survey, but um, anecdotally um, is all I can really do. Most do not. Most just want to see the view. They've seen it online. They want to take a picture for their Instagram or whatever. I would say that's... For better or worse, for, for crowding issues, 80 to 90%. Um, they'll, and then our parking lot at the point is not that big. Yeah. But even on a holiday weekend, you can usually find a space. And that means most people are just getting a quick picture and leaving. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Anything on Facebook? Anything online? Okay. Okay. All right. Jim, thank well, you. Yeah, thank you. It's fun. <laughs>